Me? <laughs> Let's shout loudest of all. Woo! Okay, when we were born, there was no Earth Day. Ouch! No Earth Day. 1939, 1939, imagine the campus. Right now, imagine the campus. Everyone, imagine this campus in 1939. In 1939, Gaylord Nelson was a poli-sci major at San Jose State University. Woo! It wasn't called that, but that's what it was. He went on to do what? To become a senator of the United States. Any one of you could become a senator of the United States of America. He went on to found the first Earth Day. You'll hear a lot about that in 1970, the same year that Environmental Studies Department was formed. Woo! And also a lot of other departments on campus. This campus went crazy in 1970, okay? We're really lucky that we've reconnected with this alum from 1939's daughter who carries the flag forward. I'm going to introduce to you Catherine Cushing, who is a faculty member in the Department of Environmental Studies. She's also on the Sustainability Board. How many of you know there's a Sustainability Board on campus? Woo! All right. You're going to hear more about the Sustainability Board, but Catherine Cushing, faculty member, assistant, associate professor in environmental studies, co-chair of the sustainability board. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much to Tia Nelson for joining us on this really important 45th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, before I introduce Tia, I would just like to take a moment to thank all the wonderful students in the Environmental Resources Center at San Jose State University and our over 70 volunteers and also our community partners who have taken time out of their day to share time with us to help teach uh, our students and the public about really important environmental issues. So please take a moment to, to clap for them. Yay! Okay, ERC, thank you so much. Um, and in particular, our student directors, Ada Trong, Winnie G, and Emily Yarinsky. They've been working tirelessly since January, uh, losing, many, losing sleep many nights to help make this event a success for all of you. Okay, so it is my pleasure and honor today to introduce Tia Nelson to you. As Natasha mentioned, she is the daughter of Gaylord Nelson, but she is also um, an, an amazing person and uh, professional in her own right. Currently, she is the Executive Secretary for the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners in Public Lands. Um, and there, she oversees assets valued at over $900 million uh, on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, which is really, really quite an amazing feat. But Tia is really much more than a high-level public official. She is a national environmental champion in a time of great environmental controversy. So here you can kind of see the connection between the first Earth Day in 1970 when things were happening like the Santa Barbara oil spill and the great controversy that we're having over issues like climate change right now. Tia's visit today makes me realize that the fight needs to continue. Tia is so committed to these issues, she cares so much about them that she's actually here on her own vacation time to share her inspiring story with us. So today we celebrate not only the legacy of her father, but we join together to move our efforts forward as a team. So please welcome me and please join me in welcoming Tia Nelson to the stage. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm gonna to try to do it with this mic. Can you guys hear me okay? And if it gets too windy or something goes wrong, I'll try the other mic. Um, I'm so delighted to be here uh, today. Uh, as Catherine said, this is my father's alma mater. Um, to be able to be with you all on the 45th anniversary of Earth Day um, in this spot where my father got his uh, undergraduate education uh, for me is a great joy. Um, I, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of Earth Day and the power of individual action. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my father's struggle to bring the issues of the environment into the political discourse. 
Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about my own personal journey as an environmentalist, and uh, I'll close by talking a bit about the challenges um, we face today. I, I will try to keep my remarks brief. I asked my father, he was a great public speaker and had a marvelous sense of humor. I asked him once what made a great speech, and he said it has a joke, it has a beginning, it has an end, and it has the shortest possible distance between the two. Um, I knew that was going to happen. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you very much. So, uh, or as Henry VIII said to Anne Boleyn, don't worry, my dear, I won't keep you very long. Um, are you guys too young to understand what I just said? Um, wasn't there an HBO series that helped you with that? Um, thank you, Catherine. So, um, I want to first mention uh, just a little bit about my father's life. He was a, a small town boy in northwestern Wisconsin. He grew up during the Depression. His father was a doctor and his mother um, a nurse. Um, and with that wind, why don't, we, why don't we cut that off and I'll go to the other mic. My apologies. Thank you. Is that working okay? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm sorry, you guys. Um, thank you for your patience. So my, my father grew up in a small town in northwestern Wisconsin. His father was a doctor. His mother was a nurse. Um, uh, during the Depression, um, the homeless uh, uh, traveled the country uh, by rail looking for work and food. And um, they were called the quaint term of uh, hobos. Um, my, grandmother was known as a, as a place where hobos could take sanctuary as they traveled uh, the country. So my father was accustomed to my grandmother bringing into uh, their home um, uh, strangers um, to be fed and, and, and cared for. Um, I mention this because uh, the early experiences of his life, uh, that experience, uh, as much as his experience uh, growing up with nature as his playground and visiting special places to fish and camp with his father, these experiences shaped him um, uh, as he uh, grew up and, and went on to become uh, a state senator, a governor, and a, ultimately a United States senator when he founded Earth Day. And I'm going to talk um, uh, a bit about that in a moment. But first, when he was 10 years old, my grandfather and he got in a Model T Ford and they drove to the nearest town where the uh, railroad stopped and a great progressive named Robert La Follette was speaking. He was a United States Senator, one of the greatest progressive voices in American history. And my father was very impressed, sitting there on his father's shoulders watching this speech. And they were in the car driving back my grandfather asked my father what he thought, and my father said that, that he thought that Bob LaFollette was a great man and, and clearly was committed to making the world a better place and cared about the little people. And my father announced then and there at age 10 that he wanted to grow up and be a United States Senator. But he had a concern, he said to his father. He was afraid by the time he grew up that Bob LaFollette would have solved all of the world's problems. <laughs> Suffice to say, that did not turn out to be his challenge. So I, I often say, you know, being Gaylord Nelson's daughter, it's kind of like winning the lottery without having to buy a ticket even. Um, don't think it hasn't occurred to me. I could have been born Richard Nixon's daughter. Um, <laughs> but but I, ha I hasten to add, uh, we should give uh, uh, credit where credit is due. Richard Nixon was a great environmental president. He signed into law the Environmental Protection Agency. He signed into law the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Laws that you might take for granted today um, did not exist before the first Earth Day. So um, let's just talk for a minute about my father's journey to create Earth Day. In 1963, he convinced then President John F. Kennedy to launch a conservation tour. My father was seeking to bring the issues of conservation and environmental degradation into the political discourse. The president agreed to the tour, um, but uh, it failed to achieve what my father had hoped. And the tour was cut short in Pennsylvania. My father was deeply disappointed, but undaunted. He spent the next seven years thinking about this issue and what might spark a national discussion about the environment. 
he flew out not far from here to visit the oil spill that I believe it was Catherine mentioned, he, he, which at the time was the largest oil spill in the history of America. And he flew out there alone to look at the damage that had occurred because of that oil spill. He got on a plane and he was flying back to Washington and he pulled a magazine out of the back of the uh, seat of the uh, plane seat in front of him, Ramparts Magazine. And he read an article about teach-ins on college campuses and how they precipitated uh, a, a national dialogue about the Vietnam War and how that led to creating the political will to end that war. And in the, it was in that moment, reading that article, after viewing that oil spill, that he thought to himself, that's it. I'm going to call for an environmental teach-in. I'm going to call to set aside a single day and ask all of the college campuses and all of the K-12 through schools to just for one day just talk about the environment. Each community uh, organizing like you have today, whatever suited the interests and needs of your community, however you wanted to have the conversation. The outcome of this idea was unimaginable even to Gaylord Nelson. It was beyond his wildest dreams that this simple idea would precipitate Earth Day. 45 years ago, 20 million people gathered in their communities and took action on the environment. They spoke out, they cleaned up their neighborhoods, they demanded political leadership. That outcome was unimaginable. And this is a really important lesson for you to remember. But my father failed in many of his efforts, but ultimately a very simple idea succeeded. And it succeeded because of the power it had with the grassroots. And it succeeded because of the power of individual action. And you as individuals here today are demonstrating your commitment to the environment and you have unimaginable power and your actions can precipitate unimaginable outcomes. My father could have never dreamed that a day to teach on the environment would endure 45 years later that nearly a billion people in 190 countries are today doing what you're doing. They are today taking a moment to think about and care about the environment. And importantly, to demand that our political leaders do the same. Now, you may have heard there's some controversy back in Wisconsin regarding my work on the issue of climate change. Uh, the state treasurer took issue with my serving on the governor's global warming task force and um, made a comment that climate change had nothing to do with our business. Now, we manage some forests in northern Wisconsin. We manage a trust fund for public education. And a vote was taken uh, to ban me from working on state time on the issue of climate change. This has created a lot of uh, attention and discussion, and I think that's um, uh, a good thing. Um, I think it's the silver lining in the controversy, honestly. And I will tell you this, any, whether you are a forester or a farmer or an insurance executive, whether you're a municipal official planning a public infrastructure project, climate change is going to affect your bottom line. Now, I don't know all the answers. I don't know what all the policy solutions should be, but I certainly know that we should be discussing and debating the issue. And we should be discussing and debating as a community what to do about the challenge that faces us today. Um, I want to speak just a little bit about my own personal journey as an environmentalist. You know, I, I, m my goal in life, my father wasn't around very much. He was a public official and, and because of that was uh, traveling. Um, he was often away in the evenings or weekends. And so I took a keen interest in what he did just as a simple practical matter so I could be with him. He was a, he was a, a very great uh, man and politician, but he was a great father too. And, um, I, and I might mention to you, in spite of what your teachers might tell you, um, you don't actually have to be a great student to grow up and be a uh, uh, and do great things in life. My, my father was a lack, lackluster student here at San Jose State at best. Um, 
and he went on to do great things, so uh, uh, keep that in mind. Um, so as, as a practical matter, I took an interest in what he did so I could go with him to political events and, and uh, I do what he did. And I had a, a great fondness for nature um, based on my experiences with him in the summertime in northern Wisconsin. And I gravitated in college to wildlife ecology. I actually wanted to be a veterinarian, but I learned you had to, it was like being a doctor and that was um, too daunting to me. So there we go again. Um, sorry, thank you. I don't need them anymore. I abandoned that speech long ago. Um, but if I got caught polluting on Earth Day, that would really be a bummer. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Um, so I, I went on to study wildlife ecology. I, I went to Washington to work for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I, I begged for that job. And I went to work in government relations, which they thought I, I might have some competency in based on my pedigree. And uh, I took an interest. I wanted, like a lot of young people, um, and, and I was not much older than many of you here standing in front of me now. Um, I wanted to travel the world, and I wanted to make a difference, and I wanted to help make the world a better place. And I, I was uh, naive. Um, but I was persistent and I managed to convince uh, the Nature Conservancy to let me work there in government relations and in my spare time I learned everything I could about Central and South America and the challenges in developing countries and protecting and restoring um, uh, forests and farmland um, uh, to their productivity. And I lucked out and got Congress to appropriate some money for a program called Parks in Peril that was uh, in essence funding developing country efforts to create real protected areas uh, throughout Central and South America. And I got some attention for doing that and was hired in the Latin American division. And then, um, like a lot of good things in life, I, I had a lucky break in a bar. I met a woman who was just sitting there she was a lawyer for a utility company, a progressive utility company that cared a lot about climate change and was concerned about a future regulatory regime and was looking for ways to mitigate climate change in a voluntary manner in anticipation of a future regulatory regime. And we started to talk and she asked me if I knew anything about carbon sequestration. Um, not only did I not know anything about it, I, I, I couldn't even spell the word. Um, but. I became intrigued by uh, uh, her story and the interest of this company in mitigating climate change. And before long, I was immersing myself in the issue and became um, a bit of an expert in the role of land use, uh, both in the forestry and ag sector, um, as uh, both a source and a sink for carbon dioxide emissions. And it created an interesting opportunity to work with industry on environmental solutions. And I mention this because I, I think that these types of partnerships and these types of non-traditional thinking about how we address environmental issues is critical as we face the environmental challenges today. I, I am convinced that if we continue to see environmentalism and capitalism as being antithetical to each other, that we will fail to achieve our goals. And that's going to challenge a lot of our traditional thinking about what it means to be an environmentalist, but I think that with innovative partnerships, with a diversification of the environmental movement itself, well represented here at San Jose State today, I think that we can address the big challenges of the day. The important thing is that we, through individual action, through demanding leadership from our politicians, uh, th th through discussion, the essential thing is that we have a conversation about solutions and that we work in new and innovative ways to address the environmental challenges of the, today. Certainly climate change is probably the greatest environmental challenge that we face. I uh, have a favorite uh, quote of my father's and it's written on this card and I sure hope I can remember it without looking because I won't be able to find that card now. And uh, someone, who was I, uh, Scott, yeah, um, um, Professor Scott, I'm gonna call him since I can't remember his last name, uh, Professor of Journalism, I, I posted the quote today and I told him it's my favorite quote uh, of all of my fathers and it goes like this. The economy 
is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, not the other way around. Our farms and our forests, clean air and clean water, it is this upon which our economic well-being is based. So, thank, thank you. And so I, I'll close with a, just a brief word. My, my father died 10 years ago in 2005 at age 89. He was asked, he worked until several months before he died. Uh, after uh, he was defeated for the Senate in 1980, he, he said he got an, uh, an invitation from the people he couldn't refuse, is how he described that day. Um, he went to work for the Wilderness Society and he worked there until just months before his death. And uh, when asked why he still worked at age 89, he said, because the job's not done because the job is not done. And so I, I, I look to you today with, with, with a great sense of hope and optimism, and I ask you to carry on that legacy. I ask you to recognize the power that you have, the power of individual action, the unimaginable outcomes that can come from your efforts, and I ask you to help me make every day Earth Day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Tia. My name is Ash Kalra. I'm a city council member here. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Transportation and Environment Committee. And I want to mention a couple of things with Tia here, especially after those great comments about what's been happening here in terms of a movement. And I know San Jose State students have been part of that. Most recently in trying to stop the oil trains from coming through San Jose, just yesterday at our council meeting, uh, we passed a resolution in support of the Clean Air Act. When I was chair of, the, of our regional air district two years ago, we were the first air district to pass a climate action plan and the first air district in the country to pass a resolution against the Keystone Pipeline. And that's just a few of many different issues that we're trying our best to lead on. I'm working with the community to try to lead on. And I mentioned that because it really did start 45 years ago. This is just one part of that same journey. And whatever it is that we're working on now, you're gonna be picking up after us and continuing carrying that torch on this issue, which as Tia properly mentioned, uh, is the most significant issue that you're going to be facing, that we're all facing right now, but you're gonna to have to help resolve. And so we have a lot of pressure from the oil companies and from industry that push back oftentimes. And we have to realize that no matter how big and powerful and wealthy they are, they don't have what we have here, which are the people and the students and the smart people, the thoughtful people that care enough to do something about it. And so I want to thank Tia so much because she's continuing a legacy that her father started, that her father, a San Jose State University alum that we should all be very proud of, started and had the foresight 45 years ago to think about the earth in a way that no one else had really thought about, at least not in US politics. And even 10, 20, 30 years ago, when people were calling environmentalists tree huggers, now environmentalists are the, are the ones that are pushing and driving the economy. So you can make money doing it, you can get great jobs doing it, but most importantly, you can save the world doing it. And so I want to thank Tia, and I think we should all give her another round of applause for being here on Earth Day with all of us. And I know they're going to be setting up for a band in a moment, but you have the unique opportunity uh, for a Q&A session with Tia. She's just going to walk over to the Tower Hall right over here. So please, students especially, take advantage of this opportunity to ask her what her thoughts are, ask her what her father's thoughts were as he was pushing the infancy of the environmental movement, uh, and, and take advantage of that. And I want to thank everyone here at San Jose State that's put together this phenomenal program so we can all work together in improving our planet and saving the world. Thank you all. <laughs>